All right, we got a great conversation for you guys today. I'm gonna bring on one of the old school firebrand Republicans. Back when he was in Congress, he was considered maybe the most right wing. My, how the times have changed. It's Joe Walsh, he's former US Congressman, or a current host of the podcast White Flag with Joe Walsh, which I was on actually. Joe, good to have you back, how you doing? It's Cenk, it's always good to be with you, my friend, thank you. All right, no problem. So now Joe, you now are considered, you went from being considered one of the most right wing Republicans to being considered one of the most moderate Republicans. And I'm not sure you moved at all. <laughs> so, no, I'm serious, right? And so, I mean, I thought the Republican Party was already extreme when you were considered the right wing. So, but what has happened since? Trump, Trump, baby. Um, Jenk, I've changed a little bit in that I've become more woke. And I think wokeness is a good thing, but we can get into that later. But no, I'm still the same Tea Party conservative I was 10 years ago when you probably thoroughly disliked everything I said. The thing yep. that changed is Trump. Right now, every Republican is measured by where are you on Trump instead of where are you on the issues. So I'm gonna quote one of your tweets here and then I wanna ask you a question about it. You you wrote, the bottom line is this, although you had it. F in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, he said, a once in a lifetime pan pandemic hit us early in 2020 when we tragically happened to have a president uh, humanly incapable of empathy and humanly incapable of telling the truth. Now, Joe, I give you a ton of credit for being a Republican and, and noticing that and then having the courage to call it out, even though you know it's cost you many things, uh, including your radio job and etc. That really does take uh, incredible courage. On the other hand, it is super obvious, right? So, like that he is incapable of telling the truth and and incapable of empathy. I mean, overwhelmingly obvious. So, how did forty percent of the country miss it? Well, thirty-five to forty percent of the country, Jenk, is part of my former political party, and I left the Republican Party about a year and a half, two years ago, after my mission and possible primary challenge to Trump. And that 35 to 40% Jenk, it's a cult. I mean, I know a lot of people say that, I've said it a bunch, I know you've said it. But the Republican Party today is a cult. What does that mean? It means they don't believe in issues. They believe in everything their cult leader does. They don't believe in the truth. Cenk, I still engage with members of the Republican Party base every day because that used to be my following. They don't believe Trump lies. They don't believe January 6th was a big deal at all. And they don't believe Joe Biden won fair and square. That's the stuff of a cult. It is, so there's two parts of that. I wanna to get to in a second. Well, what does it mean to be a conservative anymore? I mean, I think that we've completely lost the definition, but that's a super interesting, but, but before we get there, what did he do that so effectively turned a gigantic number of people? I mean, we're talking about nearly, I mean, it was 70 to 80 million people into a cult, that's just, it's one of the largest cults in history, it's amazing. Here's what he did, Cenk, and his timing was exquisite. Um, the Republican Party base for a long, long time felt ignored and they were ignored by their party establishment. And then along came Tea Party people like me in 2010 and we got these folks riled up. By the time Trump came along in 2016, and he said, I'm gonna build a wall and keep black and brown people out. Uh, I, I heard from people every day, they all said, finally. If I had a dollar for every time a Republican voter said to me, finally, in 2016, I'd be a rich man. Finally, there's a politician or a leader who listens to me. And I think Trump did that, he tapped into that, and they have clung to him ever since. Yeah, I really think that's true. And and um, he tapped into a frustration that is both real and merited actually. He just tapped into it yeah. and then redirected it and misdirected it. But my thesis is that uh, 
that Americans, especially the right wing, but both sides, the problem with the left wing, or not the left wing, but the Democrats, are that they listen to cable news and mainstream media too much. But, but overall, there's an enormous frustration in the country about corporate rule. And it feels like somebody's got a thumb on, on, on them, right? And holding them down or a boot on their neck. And, and they're constantly being told to obey. And, and where that's really happening, happening is at work. And, and they've lost the dignity and the respect that they used to have about work. And so that has built up this enormous reservoir of frustration. And every time the media says, "Oh no, it's not true. Everything is lovely in America, and the stock market's doing great, and the country's well, in great shape," uh, people get angrier and angrier. Is is that your well, experience? Well, and Jake, yeah, and Jake, you and I have talked about this. Our political system is broken. It was broken before Trump won in 2016. It's still broken. We needed disruption. Trump tapped into that. Now, Trump's an evil, horrible disruptor. Your guy, Bernie Sanders, Jenk, he tapped into that uh, that frustration as well. I disagree with Bernie on a lot politically, but Bernie would have been a good disruptor. Uh, but yeah, both political parties remain, I think, out of touch and broken. I, I look the disruptor we need. Uh, funny enough, we agree on this too. Is is from? Well, I will go more specific and say from the left, right? And so. Because the left actually says you should have higher wages. The corporate rule is bad and it is tyrannical and it's not the government keeping you down, it's your boss that's paying you $8.75 and putting all, uh, per hour and putting all these rules on you and not letting you have any self respect, etc. right? And we can help you with that, with health care, with better wages, etc. Uh, but you know, now in a deeply ironic way, I gotta say when Trump said that it's that the Fake news is the enemy of the people. I don't want to say there's truth there because journalism is super important and I don't like the framing of enemy of the people. But having said that, the news is almost literally fake in, in two ways. They, they, they put on the makeup, they get out in, in their outfits, they read a, a, a prompter that's been written for them. It's this fake neutrality where corporations are right about everything, and corporate Republican, corporate Democrat, it doesn't matter. But God, you really need the lower taxes for the rich, but you, you certainly don't want higher wages for the average guy. And we can't afford that, how we're gonna pay for that, etc. And, and that kind of, it's almost a form of torture to keep telling people that their life is great when it sucks. And it, I think yeah. it almost, so it, I, I think it was mainstream media that drove the country out of its mind. And Trump just took advantage well, of it. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that's a big part of it, Cenk. And, and look, the media is broken and the media across the board is out of touch, as you've said constantly, with the concerns of regular average Americans. But once again, that's something that Trump very cynically tapped into. Look, Cenk, I voted for Trump in 2016. I didn't like him, I figured he was a goof. But I recognized how I felt Washington needed a whole bunch of shaken up. Um, he's just a horrible, evil human being. Uh, I, I would have voted for, I would have voted for Bernie. I would have worked my butt off for Bernie this last time around, even though I disagree with him politically, because I still think our political system needs a hell of a lot of disruption. Yeah, and of course the the. The folks who disagree with that most are Democratic leadership and yeah. cable news hosts. So, uh, yes, and, and and they still, I mean, to this day, it just happened over the last two days. All the Democratic establishment is blaming Susan Sarandon for what's happening on the Supreme Court. So Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump because people loathed her because she was the epitome of the establishment, and they think it's Susan Sarandon's fault. And they, by the way, to be honest, like Washington. And, and cable news, they're in a cult too. They live in an alternate reality where Hillary Clinton is really relatable. And they think that Joe Biden is still, oh, that was shucks, that guy from the average guy from Scranton, okay? Nobody believes that. that. That's like 1990s mythology. He's lived in Washington for over 50 years. And of course he's the establishment. He tells his donors nothing will fundamentally change. And and when you're telling selling us this load of crap about how he's an average guy, 
Oh, he takes Amtrak. Oh, wow, wow, he doesn't have his own private jet. Um, they live in an alternate reality where everything is hunky dory and the people in power and the elites know best for you. And there's an open rebellion in the country. And it was just waiting for a con man to come in and capture it. Yes, and it was waiting for someone to come in and capture it. On my side, the right, they openly wanted an authoritarian and a jerk like Trump. But Jenk, I think you and I have talked about this. Maybe you disagree with me. I think Bernie would have beaten Trump in 2016. Oh. I don't know that he would have in 2020. In 2016, I think he would have beaten him. Um, but now the Democrats are in real trouble because they are still out of touch and Trump's running again. No, there's absolutely no question that Bernie would have beaten Trump in 2016. And I don't say that because I like Bernie and I dislike Trump. I say it because of the polling. So I know they didn't run a campaign against one another. That's the standard excuse that the mainstream uses, right? But on election day, Bernie had a gigantic 12 point lead over Trump in the polling. And and in from the beginning of the prime, well, from the beginning of Bernie being known as an entity, right? When he started beating Hillary Clinton in some of the primary states, all the way through election day, general election day, Bernie Sanders always had a massive lead against Donald Trump. And, and Hillary Clinton was always tied with Donald Trump or a little ahead of Donald Trump in the polling. And every day they would get on cable news and lie. Every day, every anchor. Hillary Clinton obviously is the only one that could beat Donald Trump. And I remember screaming on, on yeah. air, that's just a lie. I could, and, and we would show poll after poll after poll. And, and the country was in a populist mood. But the problem is everyone that works in mainstream media is not populist. They're the definition of the elite. So they think it's normal that you protect the elite and everybody loves the elites, don't they? No, they no, don't. And, and, no, and, and Jenk, that's spot on. What you just said right there is spot on. You and I may differ on a lot politically, but this is a populist moment in American history period. And uh, the Democratic Party establishment didn't recognize that five years ago. My Republican Party establishment didn't recognize him. They wanted nothing to do with Trump. They still can't stand him, but now they are like, they're a slave to him. But we're still in a populist moment. No question. So, but then Joe, what does it mean to be a conservative anymore? Does it mean anything? It means you're, it means, Jake, and I don't want to be cute. It just means you're homeless. It means you got nowhere to hang your hat right now. And I'm fine with that. I'm a, I'm an original free market, limited government, uh, expand legal immigration kind of a conservative. I've got no home. Uh, and I think it's going to be that way for a while. Uh, I'm not a Democrat. I'll never go back to that Republican Party, Jenk, because I, I think the Republican Party's done. I think it is now the Trumpist Party, and uh, that's ugly, bigoted, nationalist, protectionist. I don't think that's changing. So to be conservative now means you really got nowhere to go. But Joe, okay, so I, I, I totally believe you that you were conservative because you proved it. You know, you you uh, stuck to your principles, etc. Yeah. But there's like 12 of you, uh, and <laughs> so so did did you guys misinterpret what the vote, what your voters meant by conservative? I mean, given where they are today, yes. Didn't the voters actually mean? Nah, I just don't like people who don't look like me. Well, Jenk, yes, but now I'm a very unusual cat. The never Trumpers, these principled conservatives, they were as clueless as the Republican establishment. Remember, that wasn't me. I come from Trump world. I'm a populist. Uh, I left the gang. I got out of the gang. I got out of the Trump gang. But you're right, Cenk, the, the, all these principled conservatives, they were as out to lunch as the Republican establishment was. They did not recognize this was a populist moment. And they got totally fooled by this demagogue. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, most of the, you're right. You're a very rare bird. <laughs> the because uh, the ne, almost all the never Trumpers are establishment through and through. Establishment conservatives. Right? Yeah, neoconservatives, corporate Republicans. That's why they get along with the corporate Democrats so well. That's why half of MSNBC uh, hosts yeah. and pundits are, you know, because. Corporate Republicans, um, and and so it, birds of a feather, if you will. Uh, so now, 
Um, do we still disagree? <laughs> so yes. Okay. What What do you well, think we disagree on? No, you and I disagree on some fundamental policies. Um, but you and I are also both outsiders. I have so freaking much respect for you. You talked about it on our podcast, how you walked away from the corporate media because you stuck to your truth. I lost my livelihood completely because I stuck to my truth. You and I are not establishment figures. We recognize it's popular. It's a populist moment. Uh, I just I, I'm I'm more of a limited government guy, and you're more of a progressive and activist government guy. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that. And by the way, yeah, you losing your radio job—that's a big, big blow uh, to your family, etc. So it's all, hats off to you to you on that. You can relate, my friend. Yeah. Well, that's true. I, look, I, you know, I, I don't think I ever thought about it this way until you were just talking, and I thought, you know, when I took the MSNBC job, that was eight times more money than I had ever made, eight <laughs> times more, okay? Yeah. And, I, and I'd never flown first class. They, I mean, they treat you like royalty when you've got those cable news jobs. And yeah. uh, But I just couldn't toe the line, I just couldn't do it. Uh, and I didn't wanna do it. And, uh, and uh, it, 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 but we talked about that on your podcast, everybody should check that out. Okay, so uh, Joe, you said earlier that you're now more woke. I'm curious about that. So what do you mean by that? Cenk, if you and I were together five or six years ago and you said black lives matter, I would have said respectfully, my friend, no, all lives matter. I didn't understand what that phrase meant. I didn't understand how important that phrase was. I spent the last three or four or five years talking to black Americans, I now get it. Police don't treat black lives the same way they treat white lives. That's one instance, and, and that really woke me up, Jank, to the fact that, look, I'm pro-cop, I'm a white guy, but there's still a hell of a lot of systemic racism in America. I never got that five or six or seven years ago. And how did you wake up to that? Because what I would love to do, and I try to do it on the show all the time, like just for God's sake, can you put yourself in their shoes? But how did it yeah. happen for you so that we can learn from it? I put myself in their shoes. I listened to black Americans, men and women. Uh, when I had a radio show in Chicago, I teamed up with a black radio host in Chicago. And we did a whole series of town halls, he and I, where we went around, brought black and white people together. And I listened to the experiences of black people with police, black people trying to buy a home. Uh, you know what, Jenk? I opened my eyes and my heart and I listened. And I think right now we're at an uncomfortable period in American history where, you know what? Suck it up, Buttercup. White people need to do some listening. Yeah. And, and so I think that if they did, I still have faith that, uh, yeah. that, that they would get it. And I, I think that they, conservatives have empathy, but it's empathy for their immediate surroundings, their family, their church, their community, and yes, sometimes their race, their religion. Um, but I think we can, I think that they could use that empathy on others. They just, we not, have not broken through to their bubble. Well, Jank, one point I'd make to my friends on the left, I'm woke and I'm proudly woke, but don't shove wokeness down our throats. Uh, educate white people, encourage white people, listen to white people, teach white people. I think most white people will want to do the right thing, but if you put a gun to our head and say you got to be woke, I just don't think I don't think that'll work. So, like the name calling, etc., just uh, uh, immediately puts people on the defensive, and somehow yeah. instead, and this is a very very challenging part, and I don't know how to do it because their media. Uh, has no interest in doing that. They do the exact opposite, right? They we did a segment just a couple of days ago. Uh, Tucker Carlson brings on Candace Owens. Candace Owens says blacks are the most murderous race in America, and so that audience that might be you know open to having empathy for others as you were doesn't ever hear it. Doesn't ever hear the black perspective. Instead, they bring on black people to blame black people for all the problems. So. Hey. Yeah, and Jenk, know this, nobody channels the Republican Party base 
outside of Donald Trump like Tucker Carlson does. And every night on Fox News, Tucker Carlson is throwing his audience a bunch of BS, a bunch of bigoted white nationalist crap. Uh, it is a real, real danger. Yeah, it's another thing we agree on, uh, which is uh, Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson are the two dangerous to our democracy. Yes. And and Tucker is a infinitely smarter version of Donald Trump. And that is yes. and that is way more dangerous. It's super obvious that people paying attention that Tucker Carlson's whole thing is an act. He he was never like that before. He was bow tied Tucker Carlson before, and he was part of the elites, etc. He's decided to take on this persona for some sort of uh, fascistic purposes, and it is really scary that because he's intending to head in that direction. Uh, it. He, it, it's scary, Jank, and right now, I mean, we're a year out. I, I don't know how the Democrats keep control of the House or, or the Senate. Right now, the Democrats are in a hell of a lot of trouble, and Trump's going to run again in 24, and he will be a formidable candidate. Well, if the election were today and Trump uh, were running against Biden, Trump would almost definitely win. And, yeah. and then very, very, very likely end democracy. So- that's yes. that's why yes. our hair is on fire. You're from the you know your hair is on the fire from the right, mine is from the left, and at the same time, we can't get people to understand the severity of it and the urgency of it because they're too busy protecting the elites. Um, so all right now, yes. but but let's go to our disagreements. So you say limited government, Joe. There to me, whenever somebody asks, "Are you in favor of big government or small government?" I always find that to be an absurd question. Because a friend of mine, Matt Stoller, who's well known in progressive circles, had this great analogy. It's kind of a weird one, but it really sticks with you. He says, okay, do you want a large pipe or a small pipe? Well, you always think, well, it depends, what's the job, right? So, yeah. right, For do I want big government in terms of a giant Department of Defense that constantly invades other countries? No, I don't want that big government. Do I want big government? Uh, that where the police, uh, you know, uh, mistreat Af African Americans on a consistent basis. No, I don't want that big government, right? So, but there's a second element. Well, but then, but Go then, ahead. Jank, play that out. Do I want a big government that gives universal daycare or childcare to everybody? No, I don't want that kind of big government. Do I want a government, a big government that gives free college to everybody? No. Yes. I want a government that will provide for people in need. But not universal for everybody, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> good, we got disagreement. <laughs> so, Joe, here I'll give you two examples on on free college education. Um, one is uh, the the GI Bill. So when they uh, came back from World War II, um, a lot of uh, folks, and remember that was a, a draft, so it was all across the country, all different folks. And usually poor and middle class, and they got free education, and it built the greatest middle class the world has ever seen. And then my personal story, my dad, a unique time, yeah. And my dad in Turkey actually was a dirt poor olive farmer and got into college. Now he had to pass an exam; they didn't hand it out, right? But you had to earn your way in that sense. But then it cost nothing. And he went from an a, a olive farmer that had no chance at all to a mechanical engineer and built a business and contributed to the economy. So can you see why that kind of investment in the American people makes sense in terms of big government? And government, Jenk, should play a role in helping people go to college who can't afford to go to college. But I don't want government playing a role helping some kid whose mom and dad make two to three hundred thousand dollars a year going to college. I want that family providing for their kids. But kids in need, absolutely. Yeah, the problem with that is, and we're about to run out of time. But the problem with that is, Joe, that. In this country, things are so corrupt now. If you don't include rich folks into any equation, they will then spend their campaign contributions to kill the program. So Social Security works because it goes to everybody. If it didn't go to everybody, the rich would have already killed it off. That's an interesting point. That's a different point, but I, 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 I get that. But you and I could spend an hour talking about campaign finance reform. Yeah. 
All right, unfortunately, we're out of time this time. But uh, <laughs> but Joe, you know, we've had a couple of uh, meetings here where we ate, agreed 80 to 90 percent. Next time, we really got to fight. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'd like that. Yeah, keep let's, doing what you do, Jank. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, I'm, you too, brother. And because it's good to like, since we're both honest. We could actually have an honest debate about the actual issues. Yeah. So we'll do that next time. Everybody check out White Flag with Joe Walsh. And not just the podcast I was on. Check out the whole thing, okay? <laughs> All right, Thanks, thank Jay. you, Joe. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get Playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So, all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.